Yeah, welcome to this talk on search and sushi uh, freshness counts. My name is Joe Christian Bergham, and I work for uh, Verizon Media on the Vespa team. I'm also on Twitter. Um, yeah, so this talk, uh, I'll give a brief uh, introduction to, to Vespa and searching and ranking over evolving data sets. And I'll do um, a little bit of a deep dive into the Vespa real-time uh, indexing architecture. So um, what is Vespa really? Um, it's an open source uh, platform for low latency computations over large uh, evolving data. Um, it's Apache 2.0 licensed, and it has a rich uh, set of features. Uh, you can search, filter, and rank both structured and unstructured data. It also has uh, vector search uh, capabilities through approximate nearest neighbor search. You can also combine approximate nearest neighbor search with uh, regular search filters or, or ranking. So you can have a hybrid uh, retrieval and ranking pipeline. Um, it's very scalable. It's also very fast, so it's cost effective. And also has uh, advanced multi-phase ranking and retrieval. Uh, also tensors are first class citizens in the, in the Vespa document model. Um, has built-in support for uh, importing uh, machine learned um, models from a wide variety of popular machine learning frameworks like TensorFlow, PyTorch, uh, ONX, and also the GBDT family, uh, XGBoost, and LightGBM. And in this talk, I'll focus on the real-time uh, indexing support in Vespa and also the true uh, partial update uh, support. Um, but first, let's look at the history uh, of Vespa. Uh, so going back actually to 1998, um, the team here in Trondheim uh, used to run oldweb.com, which was a, a, a large web search engine uh, competing with uh, Google, uh, Inktomi, AltaVista, and other web search players at that time. In 2003, uh, Yahoo decided that they also wanted to build uh, web search technology um, they wanted to get rid of Google, so they went out and bought Inktomi, Overture, AltaVista, and also uh, this office uh, who was powering uh, the web search of oldweb.com. And the team here in Trondheim, we were set up to build the next generation vertical search platform, and that's where the name Vespa is from. And Vespa was born in 2004. Fast forward to 2010, uh, Vespa 5X came out with improved and new real-time indexing support. And finally, in 2017, uh, we open sourced Vespa to the world uh, using an Apache 2.0 license. And all the development of the Vespa engine is now in the open on GitHub. And this year, we also announced uh, the availability or the general availability of the Vespa Cloud, which allows you to run Vespa applications uh, on a hosted cloud. Um, the scale we operate uh, Vespa uh, at Yahoo or Verizon Media is pretty significant. Uh, we serve about 25 billion real-time queries per day, and we do about 75 writes or primarily updates. There's around 150 different applications across Yahoo and Verizon Media that are using Vespa. Uh, that includes Gemini native ads, Yahoo homepage, local search, news, finance, and so on. The list is pretty long. If you go to blog Vespa AI, you can read about some of the interesting use cases that Vespa are used for in, in Yahoo, including tensor ranking for homepage recommendations. Here is an overview figure of uh, the Vespa architecture of a single deployment uh, of a Vespa um, architecture. So on the left side, you have the Vespa application package. This is where you define your Vespa application. It includes the, the kind of deployment spe specification. It, uh, it also includes the, the document schemas. Uh, if you have custom models, machine learned models, you also import these into the application package. And if you have custom code. This application package is uploaded to the Vespa configuration system, which translates this high level configuration into an actual running deployment and running configuration. On the top here, we have the stateless container cluster, which is a Java container where you can plug custom query processors working on the queries, uh, custom document processors working on the documents, and also generally uh, components. On top of this, there's a set of native APIs, both HTTP and HTTP 
You can also build your own APIs on top of this because it comes with uh, HTTP handlers and so on. So you can actually build uh, nice feature-rich APIs directly on the serving container. Then there's the content layer and the content cluster where the magic is happening. This is where we store the content and index the content and distribute the content and also has uh, the distributed query execution so that you can fan a query out and get results from multiple nodes in the cluster. Uh, Vespa runs, uh, you can run Vespa using RPMs or you can also use Docker. Uh, the Docker image name is there. You can run it even on your, on your laptop. So, Back to the, the thing about searching and ranking over evolving data sets. So obviously, Vespa supports the basic CRUD operations. So create, read, uh, or search, update, and delete. In any given search applications, there are usually some hard filters. Uh, those filters could be explicit by the user, so the user get the choice to filter the search results. But they could also be hidden for the user, built in the application layer. For instance, spam filtering, offensive content, and so on are examples of a way of filtering away results that we don't want to show to the end user, but these results can also be uh, filtered by the users. In some cases, when you have a very large document volume and you want to update some parts of the documents, for instance, the in-stock status or the price or some rating, uh, it's very troublesome to actually have, if you have a very large content volume, if you have to re-index all the data just to change a few fields. So that's one important aspect. And Vespa solves this for you. Also, there's another thing that I call basically soft filtering. It's not really filtered in an explicit way, but some properties of the documents will make the document rank much lower. So it's actually not surface to the users. Uh, some signals that could be used in the ranking model could include, for instance, click feedback from users. What are the users clicking for and what are the users not clicking for? This information can be feed, fed back to the index so that the, the ranking is updated based on how the users are interacting. Now, I will go into the real-time indexing architecture in the Vespa, and I will also give you some history about how the indexing architecture of Vespa actually developed over time. So when we made real-time indexing architecture or the real-time indexing part in, in Vespa, there were some high-level goals that we wanted to meet. We wanted to have very low latency measured in the single digit milliseconds. We wanted to have operations visible in the search results immediately when the operation was acknowledged. So if you feed an operation to Vespa and you get acknowledged back that, hey, I've taken care of the document, then that operation is actually visible in the results. We also wanted to have a reasonably high throughput of operations, even if we have very low latency. And also importantly, we wanted to have a low impact on search serving latency so that in case we do operations on feed and, and do updates of our index, we don't want that to ruin the search latency or the search experience or the service level uh, quality. Before diving a little bit into this, I know that a lot of you are search experts and you know the in and out of search and how search work. But let's take a step back and look at the classic inverted index data structure. So basically, you take a set of documents and to index them to speed up query evaluation, you invert the documents so that you first tokenize the documents, you figure out which are the vocabulary, and then you build a dictionary of the unique set of words or tokens that is occurring in your documents. The dictionary contains a pointer to what we call a posting list. Here, in this case, there are three words and they're occurring in some documents. These structures can help um, speed up searches. And there are some examples here, for instance, using or, and, and phrase. The posting list might contain different uh, granularity of information. For example, some posting lists can just say, is the, doc is the term present in the document or not? More information can be added, for instance, how many times does the term occur and also at which positions. I mean, posting lists and dictionaries and the classic inverted structure, there's been a lot of resources, it's an old fashioned data structure. It's been around for a long time. One downside of the classic index structure is that it's difficult to update this structure because if a new document is added, you both need to update the dictionary and you need to update the posting lists. Our first take at solving real-time indexing was around 2004. 
And the way we did this was that we had a hierarchy of indexes with a gradually increasing size. Here, in this case, we have three active indexes. And this is basically a batch immutable index segment. Once the index is built, the index cannot change because then we have taken the documents and we have inverted them and the index is basically frozen. And operations against this was operations where you don't, you didn't really know when they actually become searchable. The search engine says, okay, I've taken your document. It might become searchable later. And the queries need to fan out all the active indexes. And this means that each individual index needs to do a lot of matching, looking up in the dictionary, reading posting lists, and then finally the results are merged. In order to not run into a situation where you have hundreds of thousands of indexes, you need to merge these in, in the background to, to uh, lower the, the, the serving cost of the queries. And this also puts a cost on the system in terms of IO writes and, 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 and might impact search performance. So in our experience, this indexing architecture did not really uh, it didn't provide a really low indexing latency, and we also saw a quite significantly uh, impact on the serving latency. This illustrates uh, the kind of the index fusion and how a new index is built when, when you have to merge indexes. Then the old one can be deleted, then you start serving credits on the new one. But hardware really evolved. So we started in the search business around 1999. This chart shows uh, how much um, uh, the price of one gigabyte of memory uh, over the time, since 1995 to 2015. And as you can see, there's a roughly, uh, the roughly cost of one gigabyte in 2000 was $1,000. That dropped to $10 per gigabyte in 2010. So we were operating Vespa or the predecessor of Vespa in 1999. We were running on, on systems with one, less than one gig of memory. In 2010 or 2008, we started seeing systems with 16 gigs of RAM, 24 gigs of RAM. So we thought, you know, we're getting a lot more RAM now. What can we do with this? We decided that we wanted to move away from this multi-index. Instead, we built a mutable memory index structure where we actually can update the dictionary and the posting list in place uh, in memory. And then back this with an immutable index. Then if the memory index is full, then we flush it in the background and then we can merge that with the, with the immutable index, similar that we did in the previous architecture. But this adds a much better buffer so that you can actually do in-place updates in the, in the memory structures. There's also something called attribute data, which is really a forward index. This is a place where we can store uh, certain um, uh, fields that we annotate in the document schema that these fields are attributes and the attribute and the field should be in memory so that we can access them for ranking, grouping, and, and, uh, and also for sorting so that that data is actually in memory. Here is an example of a Vespa document schema. There's a document tweet which has a field text. It's of type string, and we say that we're going to indexing this. It's an index. This type of field will be in the mutable memory index, uh, will be indexed in the mutable memory index first, and then it will be gradually flushed into the immutable index. The attribute field here of a type long will be in the attribute data, which is the forward index. This is the Vespa feed view inside the content load. So when an operation, and this does not cover the kind of distribution mechanisms in Vespa and how, how we do uh, across multiple nodes. This is inside uh, one content node. You have a transaction log. So you really need to have a transaction log because we are dealing with some memory structures here. If we lose power, we need to be able to recover the, in the index from the transaction log. Then there's the immutable index, which we already touched on, which is basically one large index. Then there's the document store where we actually store uh, the actual document contents. And in a do the document contents, uh, we, we basically store uh, all of the data for the document because this also allows us to, in case we want to redistribute data over multiple nodes, uh, we have the source data in the document store. Then the memory index like uh, uh, introduced and the attribute data. And there's also a mapping into the document store, which is in memory. 
and also attribute data where you specify a specific setting in the schema. We will get to that. You can add also posting lists on top of the attribute data. Then there's a feed view. So when an operation comes into the system, it gets written to the transaction log so that we persist the operation in case there's a power failure or something that we need to recover. And we write it into the memory index, attribute data, and in the document summary store. And the search view, similar, we have a, a queries coming in, and the queries have these components to, um, to search. So a query will, in parallel, search the memory index and the immutable index and the attribute data if they are included in the query or the attributes with the fast search. So this is the way the query is set up so that it's fanned out to all these different components. Now we touched on the kind of basics of around the indexing and the nodes. Now we look at actually how users are configuring, how users are controlling uh, their application. In this case, we have um, a schema where it's at the document tweet, and I'm listing a set of name fields here. There's ID field type long. We specify that this is going to be a summary. That means that it will be also returned in the search engine result page. It's attribute, which means it's in the attribute storage, so we can have fast access to this field, both for grouping, searching, and ranking. There's a text field uh, type string. Here we specify we're going to index it. That means that we will, we will uh, tokenize it, we will stem it, and we do the regular uh, indexing to be able to support uh, textile matching. Then there is a created at field, uh, which is basically the timestamp when the when in a Unix epoch for when the tweet was actually created. And in this case, we have also attribute, but here we add attribute fast search. That means that we will add uh, a B3 uh, indexing structure on top of the attribute so you can have um, uh, fast search using posting list. By default, attribute field uh, like the ID here does not have that structure. So if you actually try to just search for the ID using this schema, that will be a linear scan. And there's a key distinction here between index and attribute. There's also um, a likes field here, and the topics, which is a tensor field where we can store uh, what topics is this tweet about using a tensor or sparse, uh, sparse tensor in, in this case. Vespa ranking, similar. You configure Vespa ranking in the document schema. It's very flexible, so you can write, hand write your own expressions, or you can use machine learning models. But the magic here is that the, the machine or the ranking is able to use these fresh signals reading from the attribute store, which can be updated in, in real time. Here, there's an example of a simple text freshness rank profile, which does a combination of freshness and BM25. So BM25 is a built-in ranking feature. Uh, there's a topic ranking here, uh, given that the user has declared some interest in the certain topics. We compute the sparse dot product between the user interest and the topics in the document. So, so in order to kind of show the user uh, topics that he is interested in. And finally, there's um, an example of actually combining uh, an XG boost model, this is a GBDT model, with a ONX uh, um, deep neural network model. So back to the attribute versus index. This table kind of summarizes uh, the, 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 the features uh, that you get when you declare a field as an index or attribute. Attribute fields are only fast to match over if they have been set with fast search or if there are no other more restrictive terms in the query. But they are very fast to update. Now I'll get a few API examples so you get the feel of how you interact with the, with the APIs of Vespa. Here, there's a simple curl command uh, using the Vespa HTTP API to create a new document. So we put the document into it. We have some text here. We have an ID, and we have a created timestamp. That's fine. Then we want to update the document, and in this case, we update the number of likes and assign the value one. This operation uh, is not causing Vespa to have to read the original document and then apply the number of likes and then write it back. This is applied directly in the attribute. Right? So that is the, the crucial part here to have a high throughput of these partial updates. 
Here's another one where we can imagine that we have some machine learning uh, process going in the background, you know, either define which tweets are about which topics, and then we can go back and update a large volume of the content pool uh, with this uh, value. In this case, we assign this tweet. Uh, it's about search and it's about machine learning and it has some scores. In this case, uh, we have a pro account of Twitter, which is actually updating uh, the tweet text. This is not uh, handled, this is handled by reading the document from the document summary store and writing it back to the index. So this one is not in place. This needs access to the other uh, fields that were originally in the document. And here is an example of uh, the query API uh, using uh, the Yahoo query language, uh, where you specify the application logic in this uh, SQL-like uh, syntax, where you want to have a filter on on a date, which is application specific. For instance, uh, only search in tweets uh, the last 24 hours, and the user query. And in this case, the user query is Berlin buzzwords, and we choose uh, the ranking profile and how many hits we want to return. So everybody's wondering about performance, obviously. So this depends a little bit on the type of hardware you're running on. But this is one example where you're doing partial updates of a single um, integer field where you get single digit millisecond latency and we can do 50,000 updates per second per node. So that's a really high number. But note, you also have to write to the transaction log and that requires a high IO write capacity and if you're running Westbound, for example, a network attached storage, doing a sync operation against that storage costs a lot. So, but the default sync operation in Vespa is that we do actually try to sync, sync to storage for, for the operation so that they can be durable in case of a power failure. You can, however, tweak this and, and set this to false. Uh, the puts against the memory index depends a lot on the size of the input text uh, obviously, and also in this case, we're going to have multiple threads uh, working on, on the memory index. So in this case, it depends really on the size, but usually numbers that we observe on similar type of hardware is from 1,000 to 8,000. But remember, this is not batch-oriented indexing. This is with low latency, with a single digit millisecond latency. So once you put the document into the index, you get the acknowledge, then the actual document is there. Similar, if you look at Elasticsearch, you will have to pass this refresh setting to true in order to have the same kind of functionality that you have in Vespa. That was what I had. I included a few resources here. Um, you can go uh, we uh, read more about Vespa. You can go, we have a Slack space. Uh, we even have a uh, free cloud cl cloud trial, so you can check out our hosted uh, cloud offering. Uh, we have a Twitter account. I'm also on Twitter, and you can also follow us on GitHub. And tomorrow, there's going to be a search engine debate with me and Josh and Anshul, and I'm really looking forward to for that. So I, I hope you will take time uh, to join. So that was what I had. Um, I'm open to questions. Thank you, Joe Christian. That was great. Uh, a nice tour of Vespa. Uh, and one of you, well, I think one of your favorite topics to talk about is partial updates. <laughs> um, we have one question from Andreas uh, in the chat, and it's a bit more of a general Vespa question. So he's asking, um, how can I modify or add analyzers, stemming, tokenization, et cetera, in Vespa? What does that look like? Um, right. Do you have a handy example to show? <laughs> Yeah, so that's a, that's a great example. So Vespa, by default, we integrate uh, with uh, Apache Open NLP for stemming and tokenization. And uh, all of this is happening in, in Java. So you can actually um, take uh, the linguistic class that is there, and you can subclass it and make your own uh, stemmer and tokenizer if you want to kind of extend it. Uh, so that's definitely, definitely possible. Excellent. Um, so I had a couple of questions, if you don't yes. mind. So you mentioned recovery using transaction log, which makes a lot of sense. Yep. Um, I'm curious, and maybe I missed it uh, on the last slide, but how often is the mutable memory index flushed and merged into the immutable disk index? Yeah, what is that? so that's, 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 that's a great question. Um, so uh, that will depend on the feed rate, because there's a target for the maximum size, right? 
So if it's if it becomes too big, then it, it's going to be flushed. Right? So typically, okay. the default setting I think is uh, we use one gig uh, for for the memory index. Okay. So then it will depend on the on the on the feed rate and the update rate, right? Makes yeah. sense. All right, a so couple more questions for you. Yeah, great. Um, is there any way to uh, encrypt documents being stored? Right. So uh, we rely on the file system to do the encryption. Uh, yeah, we do that. I think that's uh, the normal uh, normal procedure. Makes sense. Um, so another question: How does the indexing performance change as read traffic increases? How easy is it to take snapshots of the index? Okay, so those are two great examples. So on the read performance versus uh, write performance. So basically, a lot of these operations are uh, CPUs. So the way we throttle it is that there's a parameter called concurrency. So it's a high level parameter where you set aside, you know, how many how, the sizes of the thread pools, which is depending on uh, the number of CPUs you have on the, on the system. So typically, these are limited uh, number of CPUs. You, you don't get to use like 100% CPU just for the indexing part. So that's how we kind of balance uh, search versus uh, versus uh, indexing. Uh, the other question, what well, I forgot it. I forgot it. I'm sorry. No, it's OK. Um, so th there's quite a few questions rolling in. Uh, we're at the top of the hour. So I'm also going to suggest we'll ask one more question, and then we'll go over to the uh, breakout room. Yep. So that's breakout room France salon, and we can I can copy some of those questions over. Um, one more question, uh, maybe a short one on partial updates. Are all fields uh, read and indexed, or just the one field you are updating? It's uh, only yeah. So if it's an attribute field, uh, we don't uh, read the original data from uh, the data store. So you apply that in place. So you don't need to read the entire document and re-index it back. 